Welcome to another episode of Betting to Made. This is a series that we're putting together here at the Chamber with CAT TV about exploring how Bennington products are made right here in Bennington, Vermont. Let's go explore how Bennington Potters is actually made. On our way to see how Bennington Potters makes its iconic cookware, let's travel through the store showcasing the finished product on many tables in various settings. The flagship store, located on County Street in Bennington, Vermont, is over 5,400 square feet of wonderful things to see and buy. 30,000 visitors come to Potter's Yard from all over the world every single year. A note of interest and of great pride for many Benningtonians is the fact that President Obama and his family have Bennington Potter's dinnerware in the family quarters of the White House. Included in each visitor's experience is the opportunity to visit the factory and see how each handcrafted piece is actually made. Let's go there now and join owner-operator Sheila Hardin as she shows us the many steps involved in making each piece of pottery. Making the piece requires us to make the model and make the block, so we need to manufacture those dies. Part of the manufacturing process is the manufacturing of those dies. And so when we talk about the fact that each piece of pottery has at least 15 actions, 15 necessary steps, goes through at least 15 people's hands, we have to go back to the making of the model that makes the piece. So that's a very important piece. Michelle was describing, you can see that steam. It's because of the chicken wire and the conduit that you can't see inside there that is allowing us to drive compressed air and allowing us to basically um, release the clay. If we didn't have that whole structure in there, the clay piece would not come off the die. Because we know how it's made, we can make it well. We have our minds attached to our hands and we're basically looking at the final product and thinking about it so the throughput through all those 15 stages stays constant. The commitment of the operator, the person to excellence. The reason we use casting is anytime we have an in-cut or an undercut or shape that obviously doesn't allow a piece to come off the press. Anything that we're pressing has to have a wider opening at top uh, at, to release. So Tom Cutler is going to show us the casting process. I'm showing you right now a mold that are split in half that shows you the cavities of it has the handle and as Sheila was telling you that the top part is smaller than the bottom and pressing we could not get that off the die. That's the reason why we do slip casting. Slip casting is a liquid slip it has a special ingredients and it. it keeps it in a liquid form. What we do is we have two cavities in here. We have to pour the slip very slow. So after the piece is filled up, this slip right here will actually stay in this mold for 20 to 25 minutes. These right here were actually casted yesterday because they're actually a bigger item. They actually, when you get into a bigger item, you have to let it sit into the mold for long as overnight. But if you notice that how the handle is out of the cavity of the mold, if you leave the cap, if you leave the handle in the cavity of the mold, you can actually break the handle right off. So that's the reason why we pour it, tip it onto one side so we can pull it out and it has the same thing. It has the handle casted right onto the piece. It has the spout and the shape. Here we are, Jackie's finishing. And what she's doing is, when we were looking at casting, you see the flashing um, at the top. She's basically knifing that off. We use a lot of knives as potters. And now she's sponging. This is a green state. The clay is still wet. It's being finished in that state. And then what's going to happen is that this, this um, truck of mugs is going to be moved over into the dryer. And it's basically probably going to dry for a day at least. So one of the ways to understand pottery is that it's basically moving liquids in and out. We um, add, the elements are um, earth and water, and then we basically manipulate the drying, and then ultimately we, we fire them. So we're using then fire. 
This is going to shrink by about 15% when it's fired. Okay, we're back with Tom Cutler and we're working with what is called a jigger. Now this is a mechanical jigger, but the jig, all of the technology at Bennington Potters, all of the techniques are very ancient. They're using machine power, but they're doing the same forming techniques. So this is a jigger, and Tom is going to operate the jigger, and he's going to be making plates. In Potter's turn, this is actually called, it's called a jigger, but as we do, we call it a roller tool. If you notice that you have two spinning halves, you have a head which is actually heated. The reason we have to keep it heated is because you need to keep the friction and with vegetable oil on it because you need to keep a surface between the two of uh, the clay and the plaster. If you don't, what will happen is it'll stick to that head. So the idea is this is made out, out of Pyrton 1. It's the hardest plaster you can get. I have a slug of clay which is caught on the guillotine that it's placed on the bolt, comes right here, and if you notice that the two halves are spinning, we have a nylon trimmer, it trims the excess off, comes over here and puts the ID number in the plate. This machine right here will actually, on a good day, it will produce about 700 pieces in an eight hour shift. This machine is actually what it has is you have a preformer which ha makes half the bowl. This piece over here will actually finish it. The reason why it's so big, I had to use a little bit of voice oil on that too. So the clay won't actually stick to that head because it's too, if you notice as it goes in, it's gonna be just about fit inside that. We have the same principles, a die line trimmer actually trims the excess off. Actually, and then it goes over to this machine, which is actually the same principle as a dryer. Like this actually dryer right here, actually what it does is forces high air into the piece, which actually makes it shrink or off the mold, and then, then we can actually pull it off. We're right now at the chumming station. This wheel is going to go around, and I'm going to use a razor blade and finally take off the flashing. But um, actually, it's not as easy as they make it look. You have to be at an angle. You want to keep it rounded. You do not want to flatten it. A lot of people use gloves. I like to actually feel the product. Sponge in a smooth. And here is your comparison, flashing and non-flashing. So Jenny here is doing something called dipping and slushing. Essentially what she's doing is adding a coat of glaze to the mugs, releasing, there's compressed air is doing suction to hold the bottom because obviously if you touch it, you'll make marks on it. This machine is the machine, a machine that I'm particularly fond of because it's solving such a difficult problem and at the same time it's such a simple solution. Uh, this is a machine that David and Tom worked out. In he obviously if you put the mug in you'll capture air. That's a problem. The water fountain or the glaze fountain just basically blasts the inside of that mug and drives all the air out so then you have a beautiful glaze. Dawn is glazing. She's putting the speckles on the big mixing bowl, the large mixing bowl. The um, sprayer is the same kind of sprayer that's used to apply paint to automobiles, a big sprayer. And we've got the, the drip size or the speckle size exactly adjusted. This is the final process before the piece goes into the kiln. What Matt is doing, you saw Dawn putting glaze on the bottom. What Matt's doing is rubbing the bottom off. We fire at Bennington Potters, we call it, it's dry foot firing. There basically cannot be glaze on the edge that is on the kiln shelf because if it is, then what will happen is that the glass will fuse it to the kiln shelf. And so this bottom rubbing or burlapping. Burlapping is the old term because we used to use burlap for it. 
And this too is a machine that Tom built, basically pulling the dust that's being rubbed off down into the barrel and up into the exhaust where it's being captured. Well, this is the kiln room, and this is what we call our kiln carts. These carts are on a trolley system that has wheels like a train. You can see the tracks right there. Right now, what I'm doing with this cart is I'm grading it off for quality. I'm grading it off for first quality, second quality, third quality, and refired quality. Once I get it all graded, I'll load it up with the wear that hasn't been fired. This is a good sign of what has been and hasn't been. These are actually identical pieces before and after. You can see how much they shrink in their size and how much they change in their appearance after the fire. You can see the difference in the clay body. This is what our kilns are lined with. Our kilns are lined with our 10 inches of it. Between the fiber and the ITC 100, it becomes heat repellent. This stuff right here doesn't burn. It doesn't melt. The heat doesn't penetrate it. These torches can hit like 2200 degrees in a short period of time. This is like a half inch stick. And this torch can't get hot enough to penetrate through that and burn my hand. Now watch how quick it cools back down. This is where we ship from. And what I want to show you is that we're, we're shipping, we're using paper and not peanuts or plastic. And a whole huge piece of selling pottery, and, and nowadays Bennington Potters is selling retail. Um, that's how we've managed to stay into business. Um, and basically, so you either come and buy it here or you can buy it online. But in order to, it needs to be delivered in perfect condition. So how we pack things is an essential piece of how we make them. So I'm going to show you Michelle working this machine that she's become the master of. What I'm going to do is program in a number and it'll feed out exactly what I need for my next item. Which is I'm going to wrap the oval bacon. We call that snug as a bug in a rug. <laughs> and with a team effort, we shoot for the lowest claim rate that we can possibly get. And we have a very low one. It's like one and two percent, which for the industry is amazing. This is our signature mug, the trigger mug. And I want to tell you a couple of customer stories. Back last December, a couple of months ago, we got a letter from a man that basically had a series of pictures and some journal entries showing us the travels of a man in his mug. And actually, yes, the story started in Vietnam, end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, and went for 40 years as he went to various postings. He was in the service, and he had just retired, and he wanted us to know and to see where our mug has gone. Come on over and see it, May. Thank you. So we've just got a full tour of how Bennington Potters actually makes their pottery world renowned all over the world and it was exciting to see how Benningtonians themselves are actually putting their hands to good use and making another superb Bennington product. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Bennington Made. Stay tuned and watch the next one.